Hey. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Okay, great. So, thank you so much for taking the time for this interview. Um, and sorry about the uh, rescheduling before. No problem. Um, so, I've sent you the, some of the questions beforehand, and mm -hmm. um, I would like mostly be interested in the whole Polis project. Mm -hmm. So, perhaps we could talk a bit about that. Okay, of course. Okay, great. Um, so, perhaps I'll just dive right in. <laughs> so, can you... Um, I've obviously been reading a bit about the project online and um, Tanya was kind enough to send me the uh, transcripts of your um, previous conversation. That's right. Yeah. Um, but perhaps you could um, just tell me um, what's the goal of the Polopolis project? Okay. So, um, as Taiwan's digital minister in charge of social innovation, talking about um, Polis, uh, mm. which is an open source, uh, you can think of an open-ended survey tool that allows people to discover each other's rough consensus instead of a pre-written survey answer. People contribute their feelings for other people to resonate with. So that's the premise of the experiment. It's mostly to get people into the habit of listening to each other and also seeing people's rough consensus in an intuitive fashion. While polis is great, there are a couple issues uh, with the two-dimensional interface of polis. First, that it assumes that everybody knows about, right? Uh, if people don't have the same first-hand experience, or if the thing that people are talking about is very dependent on local knowledge, then mm -hmm. it doesn't actually uh, make sense to ask people who don't have their first first-hand experience to talk about the same thing, because then people will essentially just repeat um, other um, people's viewpoints, uh, where those other people are the people who feel entitled or uh, feel uh, relevant to that particular locality. So first, if it's location dependent, um, then POTUS suffers uh, from that. Uh, and the second thing is that while we were talking about um, putting the statements online or putting the feelings online, what we're really saying is that writing things like tweets, like short segments of text, and not all people are comfortable with this modality. Some people are more versed in short, like pithy poems than other people. And so this gives a advantage to people who are um, highly textual or highly verbal in nature that can compress their thoughts into words, while this advantages people who are more natural talking like we're talking like now, right? And so basically the modality um, is kind of narrow when it comes to the original police experience. Original, but the Holo Police uh, project is really not just one project, but rather a series of provocative design experiments to try to solve the two constraints that the original police systems have. Okay, and those were that it's too local and that it's so textual. The uh, no, that, that, that it assumes common local knowledge mm. and that assumes um, textual proficiency. Okay, right. Assumptions. Yeah. And how have you um, then solved those issues with Holopolis? Right, so I wouldn't say solved. I would say that we explored different solutions. Mm -hmm. So um, one particular experiment in the Holopolis um, design workshops is just to get people into the same immersive world and essentially have a conversation in a immersive environment that embodies the issue at hand. So for example, if we are talk um, about a construction of a airport or a library or whatever public construction project, maybe it makes sense to have the virtual conversation, the immersive reality of the hypothetical version 
of that public construction. And so the conversation will feel more focused because it is um, ensuring that people, instead of having their phones and inside a backdrop of who knows what, it ensures that people have already uh, imbued themselves into the surroundings. So that is the emotion. Those issues with and, uh, the second part uh, was also quite a few design sessions centering around using chatbots. It could be a textual chatbot that iteratively refines what people have to say about one particular matter, or it could even be a digital assistant that translates not only the textual content but the nonverbal, like. Um, the, the emotions um, that people is already having uh, while they're uttering such uh, statements and so on into signals that other people can relate to either via emojis or to translate those non-textual uh, feelings into textual signals. And so those are the chatbot strain of uh, the Holopolis experiments. Okay, that sounds very interesting. Um, mm. I was wondering about the immersive um, feature. How is that, um, like, can you explore that a little bit so I understand how it actually uh, happens? Like, how would I, if, if I, for instance, was participating in Holopolis, then mm -hmm. how would the immersive um, feature be? Mm -hmm. Yes, so uh, one particular deployment uh, we had is through the use of e-petition. So whenever there is a local issue that requires the cross-ministerial attention, the local communities can always collect 5,000 online signatures to require the participation officers or POs, that is a team of people inside each ministry in charge of engaged citizens to mm -hmm. visit their locality. So the case in point is, for example, we had a case where um, people in Hengchun, that's the southmost of Taiwan, petitioned to have the helicopters from the Minister of Interior. Uh, they wanted to deploy it to a local airport, but the reason is that they don't have access, easy access, to large hospitals. Their nearest to large hospital is 90 minutes drive away. So they essentially want helicopter to serve as ambulance cars. Now, yes. this is a, a hyper-local subject. It, it wouldn't make sense unless you actually are in Hengchun, right? And so uh, everybody, all the different ministries that deliver a solution, visited Hengchun together. But there's many others who are not physically in Hengchun who nevertheless had a history of uh, practicing clinics in Hengchun, or they were originally from Hengchun, or they're associated with Hengchun somehow which is why we used um, 360 uh, live streaming. We did that on um, the Pescadora Islands, we did that on Hengchun, we did that on um, the various uh, different um, collaboration workshops, uh, as we call it, when we uh, arbitrated a, uh, a petition that calls for the fishing rights in the casual fishing in professional fishermen's wharfs. Uh, that is also when we moved our gears uh, to a harbor, actually, uh, for the discussion. And so through 360 live streaming, anyone can put on their VR gears and feel a, um, that they are part of the conversation, that they are immersed in the hyperlocal discussion in the town hall, as well as the possibility, uh, as we did in those hyperlocal um, collaboration workshops, for each of the petitioner to offer their immersive videos so that people can feel how is it like uh, to be in that locality. And that is especially pertinent and so the conversation will feel Pescador Island uh, deliberation about the divers wish to conserve their marine biodiversity versus the fishes people who want to fish. Um, because it is very difficult to empathize with one side or the other without actually stepping into their shoes, so to speak. And there really is no way for us to hold a workshop while diving, right? It's just logistically impossible. Uh, and so that is when uh, the immersion really shines because it puts us into the viewpoint of a diver 
right? And and so yeah, I think all these local workshops are really good deployment cases for the immersion part of Helipolis, and it does enable people who participate over the internet to first have um, an idea of what they're talking about. Yeah, sure. Um, so how is it? Um, is Holopolis like available in all of Taiwan at the moment, or is it just in certain areas? Right. So um, the underlying technology, the Polis technology, the high fidelity virtual reality engine, and so on, are all open source. Meaning that it's not just available throughout Taiwan; it's available generally, uh, and even for people for localities who don't have the technical expertise to set up the VR environment or to set up the Polis uh, system by themselves, we also offer our technical assistance in the form of a hosted solution maintained by my office. And so people can start conversations or start virtual worlds without worrying about the technical expertise if they want to just to try a couple conversations. So I would say yes, because we are based on open source components, anyone can generally use it, and we also offer technical assistance. Okay, that's great. So it's kind of like inclusive for, even for people who, who don't necessarily have the technical sort of like. And even for people who don't have the VR gears, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the. Nowadays, Oculus Go is relatively cheap, but it's still dedicated hardware. But even for people who don't have such gears, we usually just recommend people to just use a, a phone right, or a tablet, and, and they can you know, just move it around and still get an idea of the immersion. Like in 360 live stream, you don't have to uh, put on VR. You can also set up large projector screens and have more or less the same effect because uh, we don't um, have yet a lot of um, need for people's uh, position of their head or their hand in a virtual environment. It is still primarily through audiovisual. And so to deliver those, it's not necessary to have a full VR gear. One can equally participate using handheld devices. Yeah, okay. And when you have these um, like virtual meetings, um, is is the government or representatives of the government like always somehow um, included in those meetings, or is it just for the local people themselves? Mm -hmm. If you get by what I mean. Yeah. Um, so we always uh, ensure that this kind of collaborative meetings have a direct connection to the what we call agenda setting power, meaning that they at least determine what the government need to talk about publicly. So that's the minimum binding power. So it is always a degree of government uh, response. If it arrived through e-petition, then within 60 days, all the relevant ministry need to provide a point by point response to the rough consensus that was gathered on the consultation, on the collaborative meeting. If it is gathered in any other way, for example, I also personally tour around Taiwan and any of the youth um, council advisors, we have an administration level youth council, any of the councillors can also summon me. So in a sense, they are equivalent of 5,000 people. And as I visit that locality to talk about the local issues, I ensure that in the other end of the immersive screen, there's like 12 different central uh, government ministries. They may be in Taipei, they may be in the Taiwan Social Innovation Lab, but they still participate through two-way teleconference or other immersive video audio technologies to be present um, somehow in that meeting so that at least they can see through their own eyes how is it like for the local people, even if they cannot make it to their uh, the place personally. And again, they're held to the account by having to respond officially within two working uh, weeks. So that's like 14 days uh, publicly in a public transcript to any and all issues raised on this online platform. And so I think the key design um, issue here is we make sure that people don't have to adapt to come to the space of technology. Rather, we bring the technology to the space of people. To the local people, it's just a town hall meeting. They don't yeah. have to install an app. 
they don't have to, you know, download anything. They don't have to, the most they, they will have to do is scan a QR code so that they can post their textual questions like participating um, online. But that, that's it. Uh, we don't ask for any hardware commitments. We bring all the hardware there to amplify their face-to-face -face discussions so they can reach a virtual town hall, so that it can reach the people in the central administration. Okay. okay sorry. <clears throat> sorry. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe just um, like outline a bit about the the process or well Holopolis, like um, the project of sort of like um, the details, like how how and when was it like started and that sort of thing. So maybe mm -hmm. you could talk me through that. Sure, of course. So um, we started using Polis in 2015. Mm. The first case that Taiwan uh, nat national government used Polis is on the deliberation of um, Uber X, which is at the time the use of people who don't have professional driver's license into uh, public transportation uh, as provided by the Uber X um, offering in the Uber app. And uh, the rough consensus at the time was that people generally feel that there needs actually to be a professional driver's license, that the uh, cars need to be insured, uh, that protects the passengers, as well as a uh, public registry must be maintained for drivers to, who participate this way. Of course, is very important. And so uh, I think it generally shows people that it is possible for everybody to um, even given different positions, some of them are Uber drivers, some of them are taxi drivers and so on, to still come to generally um, uh, agreeable rough consensus. And so that was the first case of the POLIS uh, deployment. Now, the whole of POLIS uh, experiment starts after I become the digital minister. And it is the um, idea of my co- Understand how it actually in space, that is uh, uh, Shu Yang, Shu Yang Lin, who will visit at you uh, yeah. for the for the conversation in VR, um, and uh, I think it officially starts uh, in GitHub and so on um, in 2017, uh, okay. and there's a, a a dedicated Slack channel. There is a dedicated. Um, uh, design workshops, there's dedicated um, websites and logs and so on that was set up at the time. And then uh, Shu Yang invited many designers. They could be interaction designers, they could be service designers, they could be um, advocates from the Microsoft Taiwan HoloLens team. Um, we even have visiting participants uh, from the Singaporean GovTech and so on uh, to explore the design uh, issues about how to use Polis while solving for the uh, you know locality immersion as well as the you know overemphasis on textual input part and so there's many prototype that has been done since then uh, so it's about a year and a half uh, before yeah and uh, when did the experiment like go into practice mm -hmm. right so bits and pieces of the findings of the holopolis um, research team if we would yes so uh, uh, into our what we call open collaboration uh, meetings uh, and our open collaboration meetings uh, i think the first one that actually used this idea of holopolis is um, the motorcycle um, petition and that is also in 2017 uh, and um, it features um, a few motorcycles uh, we had that want to relax the Taiwan's very unique rule of requiring a motorcycle to take a L-shaped left turn. Uh, at the moment, uh, many Taiwanese uh, municipalities uh, forbid the motorcycles to do a direct left turn. They have to turn left uh, into steps. And, and that creates a um, in the perception of motorcycles. Uh, and so they really want to relax it um, somehow. But um, I haven't um, dr driven any motorcycles uh, and neither <laughs> have many participants. So it wouldn't really make sense for us to have a conversation without knowing how exactly is the trade-offs between the various strategies of turning. 
And so um, the petitioners collaborating with Shu Yang uh, basically uploaded a series of videos of them wearing a GoPro on the helmet while driving or various possibly legal, legally dubious um, navigations uh, of various left turn strategies uh, and even on highways and so on. Uh, and so that everybody can get a feeling of how it feels like to be on the driver's seat. Now it is not fully VR because it's just, you know, a, a GoPro is maybe just a hundred degrees um, and you, you don't get to turn your heads and so on uh, because that's very dangerous while driving. Uh, but still, it, it gives people some sense of uh, how does it feel like to be driving a motorcycle uh, in various life change strategies. So I would say that it is the first case in open collaboration meetings that we put in the immersive um, elements uh, to it. And the Pescadores Islands uh, is where we explicitly mentioned the idea of VR. Uh, the Pescador Island case, I think it's in November of 2017. Uh, and many other cases uh, followed, some using two-dimensional polis, some using immersion in one part or the other. Okay. Had a history of... Uh, Stop from... Well, kind of quickly, if it mm -hmm. was in 2017 when you started experimenting with it, and now it's already like you've already handled many of the cases. Yes, and, yes, and the and the binding uh, power part, the the part that I said that it's important to summon uh, the the virtual presence of the ministries. Uh, that again is uh, first deployed in October 2017. Uh, and so far, there's, uh, and let me just very quickly fact check myself, there's 25 uh, such um, uh, touring and telepresencing on the local social innovation um, um, organizations or the youth advisors. So about 25 uh, touring and about 47 open collaboration meetings. Okay. Can you um, or do you have some kind of an estimate of um, like how many people have uh, participated in these um, collaborative meetings through mm -hmm. Holopolis or in Holopolis? Yes, um, it, it's actually uh, two numbers, right? Uh, one is the people who um, received the whole recording or transcript afterward. And considering that each petition is at least 5,000 people, if you multiply it by the 47 cases of open collaboration meeting, that gives us more or less, you know, 200,000 people. But, but, quite, a but few. quite a few people. But, but so they're aware that something like that had happened, mm -hmm. but they may not have time to participate synchronously by yeah. themselves. And so it, it's kind of hard to gauge how much of it uh, is a result of um, an immersive experience. I think immersive experience after the fact is also very valuable, but we don't have yet a quantified result of how exactly is it valuable to have an immersive experience in addition to a textual transcript. Uh, I'll be honest and say we, we don't have a kind of um, qualitative survey of a before and after we introduce 360 live streaming or live streaming in, in any case. Uh, but we, um, in one of our more popular e-petition cases, at least people who participated uh, on the polis, um, the two-dimensional polis part, we don't know how many of them have viewed the immersive uh, 360 live video. Um, people who express enough opinions to be clustered on that case alone, I think is over 2,000 people. And so that is out of the, the 10 times more people who participate in the e-petition. So maybe one-tenth of conversion from um, a asynchronous engagement into a more or less synchronous reflection. Have the technical sort of like, and okay, so it seems like you've been able to touch quite a few people or reach quite a few people. Yep. Um, I was wondering about the police part that uh, you mentioned. So is it still like um, that polis and holopolis are still sort of like linked or connected that they're- Yeah, very much so, very mm -hmm. much so. So, so holopolis basically is, is a, an attempt to experiment on alternate user interaction modes, uh, mm -hmm. but while preserving the 
basic idea that people, once they reflect on each other's positions, generally discover that they have something in common. So, so this common value out of different positions is the, at the heart of the polis uh, works. Yeah. Okay. Making it engage with people in various different ways. Yeah. And why do you think um, that's important? Why do I think what? It's important. Oh, it's important. Well, I think democracy um, too often uh, lets people focus their attention on the divisive part of uh, the society. While, of course, it is important to look at the controversies and have a real debate, sometimes it lets people lose a shared uh, sense of commonalities. But using uh, technology such as Polis, we're able to show very convincingly that actually most people agree with most of their neighbors most of the time on the most of the things. And we, we don't remind ourselves enough of that in democracies. And for a policymaker, it's far easier for me to look at the consensus, the rough consensus, and say, let's just turn these into regulations while continuing our conversation on the controversial or divisive parts. Too often, the divisive part held the progress of the rough consensus by blinding people to each other's feelings around the thing that we actually have a consensus with. Right. And so I think it is uh, twofold. First, it is to let people understand that we're, we're demos, right? We're, we're a crowd. <laughs> we, we are uh, actually a plurality that is nevertheless united by common values. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that it enables a more iterative way of policy making. You don't have to wait four years to vote someone else into office to deliver on your thoughts you can actually already form a coherent um, vision and have the existing career public service to turn those into regulation. Yeah. So it sort of, um, it speeds up the process of democracy, perhaps. It, it makes, it makes um, the asymmetry in information more tolerable. Uh, in traditional representative democracy, where one vote, maybe even a referendum, every two years or every four years, in information terms, it's maybe three bits of information everybody uploads every two years. And it is just too um, asymmetrical because we are all affected by policy decisions, but our input through the representative democracy only is just just negligible, right? So many people don't feel like voting because they thought that this kind of input is marginally not useful for the democratic process. But nowadays, uh, through e-petition, participatory budgeting, uh, all those different consultation formats, anyone can feel strongly about something, mobilize 5,000 people, and have an agenda set in power. And that basically translates into a continuous day-to-day -day democracy that because there's no winning or losing. You can sign five different e-petitions. There is no need to choose one over the other. Yeah, yeah, that sounds That's great. Cool. How have people um, like received the mm -hmm. initiative or yes. have, have they like been active? Yeah, they're, they're very active. In, in Taiwan, I think we're uh, very blessed with the idea of broadband as human right. So anywhere in Taiwan, uh, you always have access to at least 10 megabits per second required for video conferencing like this. And if, if you don't have access, people generally feel that their needs actually. Uh, and because of that, that enables the kind of the touring uh, mechanism, uh, the kind of assumption that people can view live streams. Uh, because uh, for 4G, a limited data plan in anywhere in Taiwan is less than two uh, it's less than 20 euros per month, uh, which is very cheap. Um, and so that enables the kind of basic infrastructure. Um, and so out of 23 million people in Taiwan, about 5 million so on, to still come to participation initiatives. And we're very proud that it is um, age, the age groups are well balanced. The most active groups are around 15 years old and 65 years old. I think these two groups have the most time on their hands. Uh, and, and so we don't uh, suffer a kind of intergenerational loss of solidarity due to the introduction 
of the digital uh, technologies. That's not to say that we're perfect. We can still do more, for example, on engaging indigenous groups or people with a different cultural background than the mainstream. But uh, at least we're doing Slack channel. There is a that as well as age part of inclusion. Yeah. Actually, that uh, reminds me of, uh, of another question. Is there an age limit? to Holopolis, or is no, it... No, not at all. Not at all. The, the best petitions we received, as I said, are from the 15 years old. Okay. Right, so, so they don't have to be, you know, uh, legal to vote before mm -hmm. they can raise excellent statements. Okay. What have um, been the uh, petitions from the 15-year-olds? Mm -hmm. You said they've oh, been... Quite a few, quite a few. Taiwan is banning uh, indoor use of plastic straws. Uh, for like national identity drinks like the bubble tea um, mm -hmm. and the original petition was brought by a 15 years old. Uh, they were very um, popular uh, on the internet uh, posting you know pictures about turtles choked by plastics straws or, or you know the unsustainability of uh, dumping the, the seaways and so on. So very good um, it's like the Friday strikes. Uh, and um, what uh, we have seen uh, during our collaboration meeting is surprisingly a, a 15 years old uh, girl. And she said that uh, it is actually an assignment on her civics class. Um, their teachers uh, want the, the student to try to find topics that will resonate with people on the e-petition platform. <laughs> and so it is a, a school exercise. Um, and, and just now uh, we're having an e-petition, again from 15 years old, uh, about uh, an amendment to our referendum act because they want the referendums to stay away from uh, human rights issues as evidenced uh, by Taiwan's uh, voluntary participation into the Conventions on Human Rights of UN and so on. And so while technically these conventions are the same level as laws, so that referendum can supposedly challenge and override it, but those human rights clauses are kind of by default protecting the minority. So the minority almost always lose a referendum if it comes to a us versus them, right? So the, the high school student uh, did a petition that requires a change to referendum act that prohibits such referendum to be proposed in the first place that systemically, you know, violates or somehow amends or challenges uh, those uh, universal uh, human rights clauses as uh, signed by the UN uh, covenants. And so, again, I think it's a very good petition. And actually, we took that into account. So, yeah, they may just get what they want. Mm. That's great, to, like a great way to get the youth um, sort of involved in, in politics <laughs> even before they can legally vote. That's right. Yeah, cool. Um, maybe we could talk a bit about challenges that um, you had during Holopolis um, mm -hmm. experiments. So did you come across some mm -hmm. challenges? Oh, yeah. So um, I think at the moment we still don't have a good convincing case, as I said, of the qualitative differences that it actually make to the people who participate. We have anecdotal, uh, like post surveys and interviews and things like that, but we don't yet have a very good, quali even qualitative model of how people's perception changes. Um, so we usually talk about anecdotes like um, my first experiment in the high fidelity virtual reality environment that I mentioned uh, is with uh, school children. And some of them are not even high school, they're primary school children. So I projected my avatar to be the same height, the same size as they are. So they don't feel me as someone who is 1.8 meters tall, right? They're to me and we can talk about common issues. Uh, and so they report that there it makes a difference, but we don't have a rigorous study of how much difference it, it makes. And so okay. that is the, the, the main challenge of delivering the evidence, the accountability of this particular methodologies. At the moment, all we have is anecdotal. Okay. How could that be solved in the future? Well, uh, I think partnering with the academia for sure, mm. right? Uh, we have published, um, 
uh, the in the social archive uh, dot org uh, the paper about one particular deployment of uh, police technology the V Taiwan paper and after seeing that paper there's many different academic uh, institutions who expressed the willingness to collaborate on this and so yeah I think academic um, collaboration is probably the way to go because in the public service if we evaluate ourselves we tend to evaluate only the kind of absolute necessary part of evaluation uh, we, we don't yet have a really good model of how to measure this so partnering uh, i think even you know with the the kind of vr conversation that we're going to have um in, in your your country <laughs> it, it's very useful uh, i think because then it it enables a different perspective it wouldn't be constrained by the pressing need to solve one pressing policy issue because for e-petitions, it's almost always a pressing political issue. Nobody really has the time to do the, the, the longitudinal uh, studies. But if a uh, view from a different country, a different culture, then maybe there is sufficient room for this kind of uh, design questions for the academic opinions to be clustered. Sounds good. Because I think, um, like, as you said, there's always the sort of policy issue to be solved with Holopolis. So it's more like a, like a tool, perhaps. Um, rather than the sort of process. Mm -hmm. that, that's right. It's not the entire process yet. It's just bits and pieces from the whole police research that we deploy, but always with kind of a deadline. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about um, have you faced any sort of like technical challenges? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. The huge amount. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so so mostly I think it is just the audiovisual uh, requirements is far higher mm. than a two-dimensional interactive web app, right? Yeah. So if you you do the two-dimensional version, it almost never goes wrong, because you know if it stuck, you just hit refresh and it's back. Uh, but but when there is a synchronous element to it, if it requires coordination between different projectors, different positions, is the at a streaming. Even when Robin is not a problem, we often run a you know defect microphone or one microphone out of microphone array that is bad. Uh, or that why do I think what? It's in here uh, the left side your right ear or something like that. Um, so so a lot of audiovisual um, SOP, the standard operation procedures, are now being accumulated in a, a professional um, team so that whenever we run like the user advisor tool, the social innovation tool and so on, uh, they accumulate the technical expertise into the same team. We used to work with different vendors and different localities and they, they, they don't always work, uh, to be frank. Okay, okay. So there's a um, uh, supposedly a solution in in yeah, a way. It, it's it's relatively new. As of last month, we finally converged on the sense that of professional equipment, and we did a premiere um, with the uh, youth advisor group uh, in the executive UN because there uh, in our administration because there's many youth advisors who want to come to the meetings, but they cannot themselves come. And so it solves the immediate need for the youth advisors. And they, they are very happy to report uh, that the quality of audio visual is now much better than previously, where they can uh, only dial in through a purely audio connection and things like that. OK, that's great. Um, how about um, like in terms of technology? Tech Someone else. Seeing some um, groups from mm -hmm. participating, or have, have you noticed? Something now, our, like our design that. philosophy is that we only augment the face-to-face -face town hall mm -hmm. format. We, we never replace the face-to-face -face town hall format. So if you have technical issues that prevents you from participating online, you can always hop on the high-speed rail and participate face-to-face. -face. Um, and so I think uh, we still need to hold that core design principle. Otherwise, we exclude people. Yeah, okay. Um, I actually, uh, something from your conversation with Tanya, um, I think you spoke about the different languages mm -hmm. that yeah. Taiwan has, and uh, yes. there are quite a few, <laughs> apparently. Quite a few, quite a few, yes. So, how has has that some sort of like translating been? Um, yeah, so so we, we actually uh, just launched the first Polish consultation 
that uh, it has a auto translating uh, feature uh, in it. Uh, we, we can't take credit for that because uh, this functionality is uh, sponsored by the, I think, Canadian government <laughs> because everything there has to be bilingual, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> but but we, we, we did benefit from that. So so nowadays, if you uh, open the conversation at talk or GTW, which I just uh, pasted you, uh, you will say that it is properly bilingual now. And this is uh, a collaboration between the de facto American embassy in Taiwan, uh, as well as uh, the foreign this. And if, if you don't have access, if you see a English statement, you can always click uh, translate and it will show the bilingual counterpart in Mandarin Chinese uh, and the other way around too, so that people can converse uh, across uh, English Chinese uh, barriers. Uh, on U.S. Taiwan uh, relationships, um, but that is the easy part because the auto translation is very mature in this particular language pair. But as I talk with Tanya in other uh, languages in Taiwanese Hakka, Holog, and the indigenous, we mm. still have some ways to go before we can deliver a fully synchronous immersive translation experience like that. In that, we're very happy to partner with great uh, open source vendors such as Mozilla Common Voice. Uh, in, in that particular uh, format. Okay, great. Um, so what are the next steps for mm -hmm. all of this? Right, so I think uh, a couple of things. The first and more immediate uh, thing is just to get a words out to more designers worldwide because we, we certainly don't hold a patent to, to this idea. Many teams in many different places, the decision theaters, um, the, the, the people who you know tried this on Second Life, uh, God knows how many years ago, uh, have explored these ideas over and over, right? And so what we are now doing is just getting the word out that there is a, a lab, so to speak, to infuse your, your ideas. And so just tomorrow, actually, I'm going to uh, raise this awareness um, in the um, Venice bi bi Biennial, uh, that is the, the artist's um, biannual uh, show that representing each country's. Um, and so tomorrow, um, tomorrow is the rehearsal, this Saturday, uh, I'm going to appear uh, in uh, and um, what uh, right. and talking about the kind of uh, embodied experience and how uh, being immersive in a civic space can liberate oneself from the um, loneliness and of the exclusionary experience that the two-dimensional social media too often gives um, people. And, and so that is more of a artistic um, intervention, but uh, we wish to uh, raise the awareness of not just the policy or the lawmaking or the academic community, but the wider artist community that can do um, deliver experiences that are not, maybe not that positive, right? Because what we're out of speculative design of interaction design is still kind of positive, but mm -hmm. art uh, it can raise the, the dark part uh, of of the experiences, the the uneasy part of the experience. But those are real emotions too, and so we really want to evoke the artistic community and see what they can do out of this idea. Mm -hmm. That sounds very interesting, actually. Um, Such a friend to be proposed. The see that um, the artistic input would um, be connected to Holopolis, mm -hmm. or would that be like a separate um, initiative? Right, right, right. You, you can look it up. Uh, it's a Taiwanese representation to the Venice Biennial, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, get the youth um, to three times six, which is uh, a um, shape of a prison. Uh, and in a kind of pan pan opticon um, prison system. So it's talking about how modern surveillance technologies and um, confinements, is that digital confinements is essentially uh, traps people uh, into a um, pan optic experience and that a surveillance uh, regime, basically from the capital and the state, uh, making um, the people feel relatively powerless and the artist uh, Zheng Shuli uh, basically do a VR reinterpretation so that people who participate in the Venice Biennial um, get 3D scanned, uh, but a queer version of themselves that uh, is cannot be profi profiled, that they like the sound, the lookalike, and so on, uh, trans 
as they are. So they even look uh, cyborg-like, uh, reappear into the virtual um, town hall, so to speak. And, and so that people can focus on ideas and on the, the real issues at hand instead of on judging and discriminating people based on biased uh, profiles. So it's a public installation. And my talk this weekend will also be about how um, wearing a gear headset and piloting the robot. I'm kind of myself trapped in a small physical space. If you wear VR, you know how is it like, right? You're, you're restrained into um, actually like a prison cell, right? You can't move very far <laughs> if you're wearing a full, full VR gear. But at the same time, thanks to virtual reality, you can contribute much more uh, into a shared um, reality. It's not just virtual personally, but it, as long as it's social and as long as your gestures are publicly recorded and uh, held um, you know, accountable both to your expressions and official response to your expressions, one feel liberated by contributing in a way that is not constrained by your in the flesh presence. So whether you can travel to the capital city is no longer important. Whether your ideas resonate with people all around Taiwan or around the world, that becomes important. So it is also liberating if we, instead of saying virtual reality, say shared reality. Mm, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you mentioned that there are uh, like a few steps, next steps. Um, okay. so, yeah. Right. So, so first, yeah, right. Provoke the artists. That's the immediate <laughs> thing on my mind because it's happening this Saturday. Um, and I think the other thing that's important, as I said, is to partner with research institutions and to have a more rigorous uh, understanding of the before and after effect. And basically share all my have you faced any such experiences of experiencing the overview effect of viewing the earth from above uh, from the international space station in virtual reality how did it uh, influence my my thinking to be more long term more more generational thinking once you're in that state and things like that we, we need to quantify that somehow or at least do a, a rigorous qualitative research so that's another next step okay cool sounds good um, I was wondering, this is the whole of Poly seems like a kind of a, like a passionate project for you. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering what, what would you like to see happen with Holopolis for like, I don't know, mm -hmm. in 10 years, where mm -hmm. would you see, what, what would be the ideal situation? Right. I, I think, um, with 5G network, we finally see the possibility of delivering micro expressions. Uh, that is to say, the, the whether you're focusing on something uh, or your uh, small um, like muscle uh, reactions uh, to other people's attention and so on, the social cues. Um, yeah. Finally, it become possible to deliver that in short enough latency uh, when people are out there in the field. At the moment, to enable those like 4K immersive experience, all the participants need to be uh, on fiber optic link and in a very high end um, space, right? But 5G promises that we can do this anywhere. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think in 10 years, we'll see the 5G deployments that liberates people from uh, having to attend those town hall meetings in a physical town hall, that they can just participate wherever and whenever they want. And it also promises that people can feel even more in tune, more empathizing with each other, because then we don't have to specifically uh, curate a immersive experience on particular conversation. It opens up the possibility of me uh, just wearing a 360 um, or a few 360 cameras anywhere uh, uh, in my jacket or whatever, and enable people to literally step into my shoes. Uh, yep. and, and and just have a um, real conversation of my lived in uh, experience. And so I think the freedom from particular buildings and localities and the freedom to have a low latency conversation around life experiences, that's going to happen in the next 10 years. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> it sounds great. <laughs> yeah, that's that's great. Yeah. Um, but thank you so much. I think I've I've received a lot of information and I'm much more um, understanding about the whole experience mm -hmm. now. Um, I was wondering for the publication or for the story, um, do you have maybe some 
like uh, materials like uh, mm. have you published some articles or uh, I think you can ask Shu Yang do you have Shu Yang's uh, email uh, I don't know okay so I'll, I'll just give it to to you and, and Shu Yang can correspond uh, I mean she's the the founder of the Holopolis uh, project and the provocations uh, and so I think that will be very useful for you to get in touch with her uh, and also um, would you mind if we just publish our Skype conversation to, to YouTube so that um, it can provoke maximally the artistic communities and so on. Yeah sure that's that's okay, okay. for me. <laughs> um, I was wondering about the, the visuals if you mm -hmm. have perhaps Oh yeah, they're, they're yeah, they're live streams, right? So so yeah. you can just visit the the YouTube channel uh, of our PDIS, uh, Public Digital Innovation Space, and just browse through all the 360 live streams, and and that actually gives you a, a good idea of how it feels like because we almost always have a copy oh. on YouTube, even uh, if we use other right. platforms. Yeah. Okay. Um. So I just paste to you the the channel uh, and. Like this particular one is me piloting a double robot uh, to tour the National Palace Museum uh, in Taiwan to visit some like Japanese uh, archaeological or Japanese arts. I think it's uh, arts and crafts. And you can see me um, basically facilitating to people online, uh, more than 3,000 views on the uh, YouTube video, and some of them just ask questions and so on, and I reinterpret that and ask the, the head of the museum, who then uh, converse with my robot, which is an avatar of the collective intelligence. So it's, a, again, a live stream, even though it's not Pelopelis because it's um, that the consensus is not um, reached anywhere and there really is no binding power <laughs> to, right, to those right. artifacts. But it does show a really compelling interaction mode because people do want to see those treasures, uh, but they may not find the time to do it. And, and again, anecdotal, but quite a few people after this experience decide to hop on the high speed rails and actually pay a face to face visit. So we, we have some anecdotal um, story that says it doesn't pull people away. Rather, by giving people a taste of the emotion, people will want the real thing even more. Yeah, that's great. Um, thank you so much for your time. Do, would you like to add something that I haven't um, asked? <laughs> no, I think these are these are excellent questions. So, yeah, I, I think the the main point is just that Holopolis uh, yet is not a a well defined system. It mm. is a series of explorations and sharing of those explorations, and we adapt those learnings piecemeal into our day to day public service work. But we would welcome a lot more explorations and a lot more adaptations. Yeah, that's great. Cool. Thank you so much, and um, mm -hmm. enjoy your uh, Venice mm -hmm. um, <laughs> or virtual. Yeah, trip. My, my, yeah my, my virtual trip to to Venice. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, thank you, and have a very good local time. Thank you. You too. Mm -hmm. Bye.